Okay, let's call the meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 38, Section 18, and the Governor's July 16, 2022 revised order extending remote participation by all members in any meeting of a public body. This meeting of the select board will be conducted both in person and via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and our parties with the right and our requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website. For this meeting, members of the public and committee members may attend the meeting in person or remotely. For those who are not in person, every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Pursuant to MGL 7C 30A Section 20F, after notifying the chair of the public body, any person may make a video or audio recording of an open session of a meeting of a public body or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Beginning of the meeting, the chair shall inform other attendees of any such recording. So this meeting is being recorded by the town. It is being recorded by the Berkshire Edge and the Berkshire Eagle and other members of the public. Any members of the public wishing to speak at the meeting must receive permission of the chair. The listing of agenda items are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. Start with a roll call of the board. Garfield Reed. Here. Eric Gabriel. Here. Ed Abram. Here. Lee Davis. Here. And Steve Bannon. We are all present. First thing on the agenda is approval of minutes of October 3rd, 2022. Do I have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the minutes of October 3rd, 2022. Second. Any discussion? All votes are roll call. Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Select board's announcement statements. Garfield? Nothing, thank you. Eric? Uh, nothing, thank you. Uh, just a question. They still need to be roll call if we're all sitting here? I don't know. That's why we're doing it. Okay. <laughs> when in doubt, we'll take a conservative approach. Uh, Lee? Uh, a few things. Uh, the housing subcommittee met on October 18th. Uh, our next scheduled meeting is um, November 1st. Uh, we are having a shuffling of members, so um, the November 1st meeting is still a tentative. Um, also, the CPC will be meeting November 1st. We'll be reviewing sub ones. And wonderful news, the uh, playground equipment is going to be installed at Lake Mansfield this week. So. And I have nothing. Thank you, Drew. Um, Tom Andrews report. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, so I have a few updates for tonight. First is Houston Waterworks. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that we have received two proposals from companies capable of uh, appraising the water system to date, and we're expecting one or two more. Uh, our next Houston Waterworks meeting will be held in joint session with the uh, Great Barrington Fire District, and that will be on November 21st. So it's a regularly scheduled meeting for this board, uh, and it will be open to the public and in hybrid format. Halloween trick or treat date and hours. Oh, oh, yes. Is it all right to ask a question at this time, or do you want me to wait to see the thought was kind of Go, go ahead. Okay. Let's go. I gotta get used to having people here. So if I look at you like you're annoying me, it's not that at all. I'm just yeah. not used to it. <laughs> Am I okay? Yeah. You're okay. Fine. All right. I just had a question regarding Housatonic Water. Anybody who lives in Housatonic knows Housatonic Water is flushing the mains this week. And if you follow Housatonic neighbors, you can see what people are going through. Uh, I spent most of the weekend doing anything remotely related to water, getting it done, including laundry. Um, my question is, it is my understanding Berkshire Meadows is on Housatonic Water. And when you consider the work they do at Berkshire Meadows. I was wondering if anyone has reached out to Berkshire Meadows. Uh, I know people who work for Berkshire Meadows and many of the clients there um, have extensive needs that would require the use of water. So I highly, highly think that they're coming to Mesa Library and filling jumps up with water. So I was just curious, number one, if anyone has reached out to Berkshire Meadows to see how they're coping and if, if 
you have that on when you go to a board of health meeting and ask that they have. I think people, um, the, Berkshire Meadows is a bit off the radar because it's not really what you've been seeing. And you've heard a lot of homeowners and residents and everyone else in between uh, rightly co complain about what's going on. But I'm, I'm shaking my head going, here's this place that takes care of such a vulnerable population and no one is reaching out to them. Perhaps they're staying quiet. I don't know. They, they were at the protest. They were at the protest. Yeah. So this is impacting them. Yeah. But I'd be curious how they are meeting. If I can't do the laundry, if I can't take a shower, um, how are they taking care of the clients? Yeah. And that's a concern. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, Halloween trick-or-treat, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, trick-or-treating hours will be held this coming Monday, the 31st, from 5.30 to 7.30. Leave your light on if you're participating. Um, OPED recommendation from the Finance Committee. In your packet for this evening, I included a copy of that recommendation from the Finance Committee. Uh, they're suggesting that we ask town meeting voters to establish an OPEB trust. So we'll discuss that in more detail uh, when we get into budget season. Mattress disposal moratorium. Uh, this is really, I know the board's aware, uh, but I wanted to just publicly announce that we did put a moratorium in place uh, last week because we were notified that as of November, mattresses and box springs need to be recycled. So. Uh, until we have a system in place to store them and keep them dry while we collect them and until they're uh, picked up for recycling, I'm just looking for the board to ratify uh, that decision to keep that moratorium in place. Staff has been instructed not to sell recycling tags for the time being, and uh, our employees at the transfer station have been instructed not to accept it. So do I have a motion? Uh, I make a motion to uh, accept the mattress disposal moratorium effective October 18th until further notice. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, unanimous. Great. Thank you. And uh, Joe and I, one of us will be back before the board for an update as soon as we have something to share. So next up is uh, Joe Aberdale, our, oh no, I'm sorry, I skipped over. Chief story is I don't have right, I don't have yeah. the post right. So you might have to oh, let me try to get that to you. Okay. So in your packet for this evening was an executive summary from Chief Story to consider increasing the parking fees townwide. So he's gonna explain his request and look for support from the board. Uh good evening. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for uh, considering this. Um as part of our new uh, parking. Um, processing structure program that we, we worked on a few months ago. Um, thought it was a good time maybe to reevaluate the, fee, the the fine structure that we have had in place for many, many years um, for parking violation. Um, in the past, or currently, all parking fines are $20 for a violation with the exception of handicap uh, violation, um, which was 100 um, I did some research with other municipalities um, across the state and um, in Berkshire County and uh, find that we're on the definitely on the low end. Um, that range goes from um, a $20 fine up to um, some some municipalities <coughs> charge uh, upwards of $100 for, for such violations. Um, so I made a proposal. Um, as you can see, most uh, most of the violations, I, I asked for an increase from $20 to $25 with the exception of uh, double parking, um, parking within um, a fire lane and fire hydrant, um, and um, increase the handicap violation. I'm also asking that we consider uh, blocking a, a wheelchair ramp. Um, that's That would be a new a new uh, fine that we don't currently have on our, um, on our list of uh, parking violations. And also for a boot fee, a boot fee would be for, if it doesn't happen often, uh, I can think in my career, maybe twice we've done it, uh, somebody who's um, refusing to pay their fine and we come across their vehicle park, we do have a parking boot that we can put on um, for those egregious uh, violators. So to have the boot removed would be a $50 fee for just uh, the hassle. 
Um, I also, in my my uh, summary, I asked for um, a, f- a five dollar um, late fee assessed for any parking violations that are not paid within a twenty one day period. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. If you have any questions um, about the program, I know we we had a meeting on that, how that was going to work, and that's how this uh, discussion came about. One question: If if somebody um, is appealing or dis- disputes, the, do they get charged the late fee? Do they have no, to pay? no. If okay. they request a hearing within the twenty one day uh, period, um, we will uh, take that uh, request. We will schedule a date and time with the hearings officer, and then we would notify the um, the Plymouth County um, who's processing everything that they have appealed it. Um, they'd be put on like a, a temporary hold until the resolution of that ticket. Thanks. Also, if, if the uh, document you submitted to us is, is what's getting filed, numbers 16 and 18 are the same, parking 12 inches from a curb. It's just you repeated it once. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and Thank just, you. just if, but Ed, um, if they did appeal after that 21 day period, that would be a, that would be a late response. Got it. Thank you. Anyone else? Eric? Yeah, I guess I don't think I'm seeing it on the list, but just the um, charging stations, um, the new uh, charging stations in the back parking lot, uh, the electric vehicle stations. Um, I think that would be parking outside a prohibited area is what that would fall under. Um, and I know that the signage is up. <clears throat> okay, good. Anyone else? Do I have a motion? Would you like me to read all the... No, I think it's a motion to accept the recommendations. Okay. I make a motion to accept the recommendations of the Great Barrington Police Department. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. And then the last update we have for this evening is from Joe Aberdale, our Director of Public Works, and he's going to provide... Uh, just a real quick update on a number of projects in various stages of completion. You might need that, that mic, Joe. It's a second. It's awesome. yeah. um, we'll start with roads. Um, we all know the Bridge Street Bridge is um, being worked on. Um, it's in its final stages. There's um, some guardrail um, lines need to be painted and some rolling and seating. Um, the target date is before Thanksgiving. If all goes well, we'll see it much sooner. So, you know, a lot of this is still contracted work and weather. Um, Berkshire Heights, um, we have the paving project going on up there. Joe, can you slow down a second just in case someone can't hear you? Eileen, did you have a question? I'm, I'm having trouble hearing him. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. See how, yeah. Um, Berkshire Heights, um, we've been up there for quite a few weeks now, where we have the time, final top pavement happening later this week, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so we for. Um, again, the weather can always impact that a little bit. We also have, right after that, Monday, Tuesday, the following week, Locust Hill Road is going to be paved. Um, and that will finish that contract. Um, Christian Hill Colbert, um, slated for, you know, things are going well, slated for finishing this year before blacktop season's over, getting everything covered up and closed up and tightened and going back open. So right after Thanksgiving, the first weekend of December is the target. Um, probably return next year to finish a few plantings. Um, the other project we have um, in the crosshairs right now is the main street, the crosswalks and the safety improvements that I think you're all aware of. Um, that's in its final design stages right now. Um, and it's having for bidding, pulling out for bid right after the first of the year. Um, moving on to buildings. Um, first off, the Houston Community Center, Center we have um, a weatherization program continuing up there, doing some insulation work. Um, we have a grant from um, pressure regional planning and some town funds. Um, that we don't have a date on that yet, but we will coordinate it with the, the basketball when we get all the other users there. Um, quite a substantial savings and energy costs are intended there. Um, 
Mason Library, which we all heard about the HBC issues in, in the, in the uh, equipment's order. Um, it has a long lead time, but we have a target completion date of June 15, um, that the contractors agree to when feels in the need. Um, so before heating season, before, before cooling season, we'll have something in place. Um, Ramsdale Library, we have a couple projects there. We have a boiler replacement program um, that's already been awarded to a contractor. Um, materials been ordered. Um, and we have the handicap access, which is in its final design phases right now. Um, the plan with that will be to be out to bid right after the first of the year again. Um, so it'll be a period we work with the library director. It will be a period of uh, the library will be shut down for a couple of weeks while we interrupt the, the access and we'll try to squeeze the water over at the same time. Um, the final building project is the senior center. Um, we have um, the police department was successful in securing a grant for installing the backup generator. Um, so the curve has been done on that and we're just waiting to schedule. Um, moving to parks, um, we mentioned Lake Mansfield. Um, so equipment, equipment is scheduled for this week. There's been some excavation work. Um, it was a playground. Um, there's nine trees scheduled to be installed on Monday. You know, that was work between um, the Parks Commission and the, the tree warden. And um, the memorial field improvements were in final design there. And the intentions are to have that up to bid right after the first thing at all. The final parks project we have is um, the, the restrooms at Olympia House. Um, that's just getting off the ground now. And again, we hope to be in construction of that next year, too. Questions, comments? This one. Uh, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Uh, question about Division Street. Um, would we be waiting possibly for the state to turn on the lights? The, is that something that we're the kind of lights are yeah. in, um, They have been tested. The conduit's been mm -hmm. in, so everything should be fine there. Okay. I understand the state has also been out and inspected the bridge. Um, so things are all set there. Awesome. Okay. And you probably heard that tax requested to, to have their oh, yeah. pumpkins. Yeah. I guess it's going to be past that. pumpkin yeah. season, but Absolutely. they can drive their gourds across. Them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also one other question, please, the Memorial Field um, improvements. Yep. What, are we, what are we going to be seeing there? Um, handicap accessibility. Um, Paul Gibbons asked to see it before he's no longer around. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, handicap accessibility, some um, dugout improvements. Um, I can share the plans with you if you like. Okay. So, so the market will distribute it. It's a major change in the field. I mean, as far as upgrades. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that should be done. Is that is that a long process to, to do that? Not really. It shouldn't be too bad. You know, the goal is to get these things up to bid and you know the early part of the year. So contractors are looking to fill their springs up, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. So that's the so baseball season. Right. Well, yeah. Thank you. And just to repeat division street, you hope you Really anticipate it will be open by Thanksgiving. By Thanksgiving, it is is pretty much guaranteed. It's, it's how much earlier we're going to get. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm not holding my breath, but Cottage Street Bridge. Do we have any kind of a date? Um, I don't have any dates, but I know the state is working on it. Okay. You know they they have it in design. Um, they haven't shared any plans with us at this point. But we also know that that wasn't put on the list till 2025. Originally, yeah. yeah. So, like, they're really going to move us up. <laughs> and, um, and then I just wanted to, you know, the board knows that the, um, the gymnastics the staff went through to get the Housatonic Community Center work done, uh, that twisting some arms, changing some grant deadlines, uh, redesigning, re yeah. heavily finding money here and there. So, thank you. Yeah, for no, that. the Parks Department coordinated with us. That went nicely. Uh, yeah. So I just Team wanted that said out loud. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Michelle? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I didn't see your. Um, first of all, I apologize for not introducing myself. That's fine. I'm about to be Michelle, but they are 70 Division three. I do live down the road from the Division Street Bridge construction. Um, I have. Uh, in writing, expressed concerns about safety during the project. Um, I my I, I go down there frequently, look at the project, and as a matter of fact, my husband and I we went down to the bridge yesterday, 
And we were surprised to see the gates wide open. Anybody could have walked in there. Even a small car could have driven in there. We did walk in. And what was scary is that kids had gone in there. There are gaps, of course, the bridges and done yet, where somebody could fall through. Um, and there are other hazards there. So that's an, another, yeah, another example of my safety concerns. Other safety concerns were how the trucks were racing up and down from the construction site, backing up without flaggers in a heavily populated residential neighborhood. These are all on writing with the town manager's office. Um, my question for, oh, Joe, oh, thanks, Joe. Um, I mean, notice there are two lights on either side, and there's probably an obvious reason why that is being done. I'm just curious why. Why there are two lights hanging on like my side, and then over on the other side, there are other two lights. So, well, typical design is usually a pole mounted and a stand mounted light. And you know, in the event there's a light ball out, you still have a second. So, it's a spare. It's a, it's a spare, but it's also safe. And, it, and it, it's fine, but again, this is a residential neighborhood. It's kind of in your face, but I understand the logic you're expressing here. And also, I just wish to reiterate uh, my concern and that of some neighbors that Division Street will become a truck bypass. And we're kind of upset because, yeah, the bridge has to be open without a doubt. Although I myself have enjoyed seeing Taft's pumpkin trucks going by my house, which normally they would not do, that the bridge was open. And the traffic was quite heavy and fast before the bridge was closed. And my conversations with people in town government uh, reveal that it's probably going to be more so. And I just want to reiterate my concerns on that and that there are neighbors who are concerned. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Garfield, go right ahead. I just had a uh, question. We are, it's going to be one way, the bridge, right, at, um, at a time, sort of like we do in we are going to stop, yes. people over and, then, and that will be permanent. It would be, be like that during the temper while the temporary bridge is there until the permanent bridge is rebuilt. Okay. So the timing for the lights um, was based on the traffic study, and it'll be monitored throughout throughout construction or throughout the temporary bridge. And if it needs to be adjusted, it can be adjusted. I just have a, um, some concern, and I'm not sure if it's if we're responsible to leave the city or not. But some of the yellow lines, maybe not in town, but you coming into town are so faded you can barely see is that something the state is responsible for yeah so can be can we get a hold of them and have them sure take yeah. care of that yeah if there's some in particular you're concerned about we can get a hold of the state you probably noticed there have been lines being painted in town for the last few weeks you know um, so bad in town kind of out of town going south i noticed that like, like on seven or 23 yes exactly okay well that's state highway um you can take a look at that thank you Actually, I'm meeting with them tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Um, you didn't talk about the roundabout, so <laughs> and you probably so I know that was on your list, but um, yeah. I'm just curious about uh, getting any complaints. I, I've heard uh, people saying that they've seen cars get stuck, and um, so I'm just wondering: is this is this? Are you hearing anything from your department, or is this something maybe that Mark um, handles? So I've only been here a few months. <laughs> so early on, everybody was up and up. There was a lot of discussion and calls and stuff like that. I um, mean, even if you went down there, because part of that made did some work around the police station of course. Um, so early on, you wouldn't stand there for a few minutes without hearing horns beeping and everything like that. You, you go down there now, and it's substan substantially less. Um, I think people are getting used to it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need people to use the directionals that's coming out of the ground well. Um, I think as a chief has a sign posted down there now. Um, but as far as questions or concerns coming into the office, it's next to love it. I'll send one. I thought it was state. That's why I didn't. What's that? I thought it was state. You would not really town. So. Well, it is a state project. Just get behind a really big truck and you'll see an issue with it. Yeah. And I have. Trucks. Well, that would be the state. Okay. They're the ones who designed it. Yeah. But we would get, still get the complaints, though. I mean, even though it's. I think uh, early I'm on, saying. before the final course about black cup was put on, you know, and the driving surface was down three or four inches, when a truck would go around, it would step quite a bit. I think you'd see quite a bit less tipping now, now that the final pavement is on. 
but mm -hmm. it's being used by trucks the way it's designed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate it. Anything else, Mark? No, that's it. Okay, hey, licenses and permits. Catherine Hand for Berkshire Cider Project for a farmer winery license to sell their cider at the Winter Farmers Market on um, November 19th, December 17th, January 21st, which should be 2023. February 18th, 2023, March 18th, 2023, and April 15th, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Housatonic Community Center. Um, Catherine is on and her mic is open. Okay, thank you. Catherine, do you want to just give us a little uh, update on what you're doing there? Same as sure. last year? Sure. Absolutely. Yep. Same as last year. Um, we're planning to uh, sell our hard cider at the Berkshire Grown uh, Winter Farmers Market. Um, we won't be planning to do any tastings at all. So just sealed containers for folks to enjoy and bring home. Um, and it went really great last year. It was a really great um, market for us. And we hope to do it again. Thank you. Do you have a motion? I make a motion to approve <clears throat> the farmer winery license to Catherine Hand for the Berkshire Cider Project to sell their cider at the Winters Farmers Market on November 19th, 2022, December 17th, 2022, January 1st, 2023, February 18th, 2023, March 18th, 2023, April 15th, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Housatonic Community Center. Second. Any discussion or questions the board has or anyone? Hearing none, roll call vote. Garfield? Aye. Eric? Aye. Ed? Aye. Lee? Aye. And I, unanimous. Good luck. Thank you so much. Next is a special permit recommendation to the planning board and the application from Lennox Landings, Barrington Brook Holdings, LLC, to modify the open space residential development special permit granted February 2013, the Stone Path Development, specifically the open space boundaries on Thrushwood Lane. Jim Scalise is on, his mic is open. Okay, Jim, do you wanna introduce yourself and give us an explanation? Sure, uh, can everyone hear me okay? You can. Um, uh, good evening. For your record, Jim Scalise. I'm an engineer with SK Design Group uh, here on behalf of um, its uh, the owner. It's LLBBH LLC, uh, which is the successor to the original uh, uh, permit E, which was uh, Stone Path Development or the Barrington Brook Development um, um, here in Great Barrington. The uh, the proposal here is actually quite straightforward in that the applicant is proposing to relocate a single family home that was approved in phase two of the project, which is Thrushwood Lane, and wants to relocate it from lot 1011 to lot one. Now, lot 1011 has been uh, merged into a purchased by one buyer, both lots, and a single home was placed kind of on the dividing line between 10 and 11, which kind of eliminated a dwelling unit. And the, uh, the applicant would like to amend the uh, old special permit to just relocate that to some available land on lot one, um, which is the first lot on the left as you enter phase two of the project. So the, um, there's no new uh, or additional dwelling units. The project was originally 44 units. The proposal is to keep that the same. Um, as I did a review of the permitting process, I believe back in you know 2013, there was some fairly lengthy permit decisions that all quoted the exact amount of open space. So um, the open space provided was about 63% of the project area where 50% is required. And uh, rather than try to reduce that or ask permission to, to, to remove some of the land from open space, what we're trying to get permission to do really is to reconfigure it. So that at the end of this process, we would have exactly the same amount of open space. Um, we would just uh, move the lines, uh, some to the benefit of the open space and some to the detraction, which would allow this this uh, dwelling unit to be constructed on lot one in a land area that is currently open space. So that's what this is really about, is just moving a house 
Um, there's a subdivision permit that was included as part of the original process and that quoted the open space plan. So that if, if this were approved by the planning board, ultimately we would need to have a surveyor. I believe Mike Parsons worked on it originally. We'd ask Mike to amend that plan. We'd have to file that in the registry, but it requires a special permit amendment before we can do that. Do, do we have any questions? Yeah, the various maps that are included in your proposal, does one of them do a, a, a good job at showing at the same time what, what we're losing and where it's being gained? Yeah, I, 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 I tried to, let me just see if I can find, um, it would be a, an attachment C, it would be the second drawing, uh, no, the third drawing. So the last drawing in your packet, or in your packet, it's page 35 of 62, if that helps. I don't know if you're looking online, but there's kind of an overview. Um, it's drawing three of three in the lower right-hand corner. And mm -hmm. um, in there, we show some areas that are shaded solid, which are areas where open space will be added kind of around the entire development. And then there's two areas that are hatched or have a diagonal hatching symbol, which over on lot one, which is on the right side of that plan, that's where the new house goes. And then on lot five, based on where the house footprint is, the open space doesn't work well there. So we're trying to reconfigure the open space on that lot while we're at it. So my concern is we're losing a big chunk of open space and getting lots of little ones. And I sort of the whole point was to push the houses close together so that there's more open space. Mm -hmm. And it seems like this is a move to go the other way. Um, potentially, I, I, I see your point. I think the, the fact that the, I think the planning board did a good job of maximizing open space originally, meaning that 63% where the goal of the bylaw was always 50%. So I feel as though um, there might be some consideration given that we're, we're quite a bit over what the uh, minimum requirement was, um, but that's a, a fair comment nonetheless. At the end of uh, at the end of this, what would be the percentage of open space? Sixty three percent. We're going to maintain that same percentage. Just maintaining it, just spreading it out. Correct. Other questions, Lee? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that there's forty four units. Are they all occupied, or where are we in terms of the occupancy? Um, there are. Let's see, we have on this plan that we were just looking at, this three of three, it, it, it denotes the future houses. There's one, two, three, four, five, six left. There's six house sites that aren't built. And you, if you look kind of in the inside the house, it's shaded a little differently, which you may not be able to see very well, but the, it actually says future house instead of existing house kind of inside it. So it's lot five, lot two, lot 14 and 15, and then on lot one, it's kind of A and B there. So a total of six that aren't built. And and how long has this been development? I mean, it's been quite a few years and to have still uh, six sites available. Yeah, I think, um, well, there's been, <laughs> there's been about a dozen houses in the last uh, 18 months. So it's there's been a ton of activity recently. Uh, this project has been going on since the late 90s. Is all the infrastructure um, done? Is everything that yeah, it's done? um, it's about ninety eight percent. I mean, we have some work around the circle, the cul de sac. There was just extending a drain line here this fall. I haven't been back down there in a couple of weeks. They were working on that, so I don't want to uh, report exactly where they're at there. But th they've got to be ninety ninety five percent complete. <clears throat> Water, sewer, drain. I mean, this the site's built out for sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> probably going to make you repeat yourself here. So this you're adding a future a future lot just because somebody bought two lots and put one house on it. So uh, if, if you look so on this, you were, you were accepted to put X amount of houses on it. And since uh, one person bought two lots, put one house on, you're trying to carve another lot in. Yeah, we're trying to maintain the same number of dwelling units, which is how we offset the infrastructure cost, frankly. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but are there any legal challenges going on right now with any of the, um, the work that's being done? There's none that I'm aware of. 
Any other questions? No, well, let's try. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to uh, modify. Sorry. Send a positive recommendation. To send, thank you. <laughs> to send a positive recommendation to the um, the planning board on the uh, open space development special permit granted on February 2013 to Stone Path Development. Do you have a second? Second. Discussion. Yeah, I guess I, I don't know if the planning board and everybody already went through this thoroughly, however many years ago it was. <clears throat> I, I don't know why the, the, the plan would change just because somebody bought two lots and put one house on it. I think that just, I understand that kind of in itself creates more open space, but I don't know why we would go back and look at this and start changing, changing lot lines again and open space lines just because a single person wanted more land to themselves. So I don't see why that would have us take away from the open space stuff uh, the way it was originally intended. Yeah, I was going to see if we could add something to the motion um, expressing that reservation, but leaving it up to the planning board since they initially came up with the plan. You can make an amendment to the motion. That's um, fine. If I could phrase that in English, that would. <laughs> um, but does that does that help? In other words, the planning board came up with this. I, I, I sort of I, I don't want to tell them we think it's a bad idea. Um, I, I want to tell them to look carefully. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that. It's, I don't know that it's a good idea. I guess I'd say it that way. Um, should I try it? Yeah. Go. Okay. So um, I, I'd like to add to the amend the motion to say. Um, we're we're not voting we're not against this, but we want the planning board to look carefully to make sure it still aligns with the original intent uh, of the perm permit they initially gave. Do I have a second to the amendment? Second. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. Yeah, I guess I just feel like it's uh, you know, say I forget the exact number, but there was 44 lots intended. He sold 44 lots. Now they're trying to sell another one because somebody bought two. So I don't know. That's just something. It doesn't feel right to me. Um, so I get it. Yeah. Anyone else? So we're going to vote on the amendment first. Garfield? Aye. Eric? Um, no. Ed? Aye. Lee? No. And I. So the amendment passes three to two. Now the original motion. Do I, any other discussion? So on the original motion, Garfield? Aye. Eric? No. Ed? Aye. Lee? No. And aye. So it passes three to two. Our recommendation is a positive recommendation, three to two. We've done other wording. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your consideration. You. I will uh, I will pass along your comments. Pretty much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is the first of two uh, Lucy Punnett School RFPs. Uh, this one um, tonight, and then in our, our next meeting will be the second one. We are very excited about, about these two presentations in the, in the phase two. Um, the select board, just so everyone understands, will not give an opinion tonight, uh, either positive or negative, on this presentation, nor will they at the next meeting. Uh, I think it's we need to be fair to both developers to hear everything. And then the meeting after that, so the third meeting, this is the first to be the second one in two weeks. And then the third one is when we will hopefully um, vote on it and give our opinion. Um, tonight will be a chance for the select board and the public to ask questions of the um, first presenter and they will make their presentation and then we will start discussion. Go right ahead. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, for the record, Kathleen McCormick, McCormick, Murtad, Marcus. I'm here on behalf of Arit Ventures Partners, LLC. Um, we decided to kind of do a hybrid presentation to you as well. So um, with me in person tonight 
is Anthony Barnaba, who is the local architect, Blue Line Design. And then joining us remotely is Jeff Glickman and Elliot Fireworker. Um, for those of you who were not at the original initial meeting that we discussed the project, um, Jeff and Elliot are general partners for the project. Um, Jeff is joining us from Ontario, uh, Toronto, Ontario, and Elliot is Nanuet, New York, and they both have vast experience in rehabilitation and repositioning existing buildings into mixed-use spaces. We also have joining us um, through Zoom, Suzanne and Claire representing Houstonic Real Estate who are partners in this project. Um, so I think I'm going to pass it on to Jeff to start um, the presentation, and then we'll answer all of um, the questions that anybody has. And Anthony also brought um, some of the drawings that were part of the packet. So if you follow along from remote, you can see anything that we're showing in the packet, and we're going to try to get it so the camera picks it up here. So um, Jeff, you want to take it over? Sure. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Everybody can hear me? Okay. Good evening once again, everybody. Thank you for taking the time again. We're, we're delighted to be here and to discuss our discuss our um, proposal to you for the Houstonic School, which we remain very, very excited about and very passionate about. Um, oh, also, I should just start off by saying, excuse my Canadian boots. Those, those, that's, if anything else, it's proof that I'm, I'm my citizenship is genuine. So, and you'll also hear it on words like sorry too, that comes out the Canadian accent. Anyway, that being said, um, uh, I'll briefly go over what we are, again, what we are doing with this, with this, what we're intending on doing with this project, should we be awarded, um, where we'd like to take the buildings, use cases and purpose and things like that. And, um, and then go over a few more details that have changed since the first time we approached you. Now, first time we, we presented to the to the select board. So um, again, the, the 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 building stands tall in the in the in the um, in the township center, and um, the top two floors, floors two and three, of the building will be converted into fourteen um, long term rental residential units. Of the fourteen, four of them will be studio units, four of them will be two bedroom units, and six of them will be. Uh, one bedroom units for a total of 14. Um, of the 14, the four studio apartments will be affordable housing, meaning they will meet all the criteria and the price point that is required at that at that for that for that designation, and um, they will they will all meet with with the proper with the proper checks and balances for for that for as long as they need to be assigned that way. Uh, usually, it's it's a 20 year horizon, from what I understand. Um, that being said, um, on the main floor as well, um, and also I should also mention we, Anthony Barnaba here also has, uh, as I'm talking, drawings that you can look at, and he also has some sample layouts of the apartments that we have um, uh, taken uh, taken our first pass at. Um, the main floor is to be a converted into a community-minded space. It is a commercial space with a community mindset. Um, the, it will be, first of all, integrated into the, the landscaping around it by virtue of a dugout on the east side of the building, which will take the grade down to the original grade of the building, which is at the footing of, of the main floor. Uh, there will be hardscaping applied there. There will be an open window concept so, so that people can exit easily from that side of the building, uh, letting in more light, and creating more of a, more of a flow. And the entire uh, ground floor will be converted into one large, uh, effectively 5,500 square foot space with also a thousand, roughly a thousand square feet of um, space for, you know, uh, utility room and, and, and furnace room, et cetera, et cetera, boiler. Um, the, the intended tenant, um, oh, the intended use case for the, for the apartments is obviously local long-term rentals, um, local, lo lo locals to, to Great Barrington and Housatonic. Um, the intended tenant for the, the commercial space is one that we want to take a considerable amount of time and energy to make sure that we um, bring in the right tenant for that space. Um, but we, effectively, it's, it's, it will be a tenant, whether it be commercial or, or uh, somebody with a commercial interest or with a community managed store or not for profit or the township itself or whatever the case is. And there's no presumption on, on the town, by the way. I'd like to be clear about that, that it will be somebody who will... Um, have a use for that space 
that encourages community traffic, human interaction, human capital, um, you know, effectively uh, 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 people, people being present, being around. Um, with the integration we have with the Alice Brisky Playground, the way the way we're redoing the, the landscaping and the way everything is going to connect, we want that to be a sort of a seamless transition. We want this to be a sort of epicenter of growth uh, for the town. Um, and one of the other one of the other uh, uh, ventures that we're taking with the main space is kind of an, an add-on to the main space is that we will on-site store a. Uh, a pop-up gazebo, which is it will be accessible um, and usable um, by the town, uh, by any group that wishes to use it, so that at the north side of the property, a tent, a large tent will be erected whenever desired. And if, you know, assuming we can work with, 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 the, uh, with the playground, that, the, that an event can spill out from our building into the, into the playground. And that can be, that can be a source of uh, sort of cultural and community enhancement for the town, that whenever there's a big event to do, or, or an event that 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 would work in this in this type of a venue, that we can utilize that venue and work with whoever is the commercial tenant to achieve that. Um, again, we're playing with a lot of different ideas, a lot of different potential, uh, a lot of different potential um, uh, partners for that, um, uh, and um, we continue to we, we we want the we want to involve ourselves with the town to make sure that that tenant is the right tenant for that space and for what we're trying to do, which is to establish a, a, an integrated um, mixed use building. So that is the overview. Um, I will now pass it over. Um, and I, I understand that the large purpose of tonight is to, is to, uh, to get also onto a question and answer, which we are prepared for. So I'd like to just at this point, pass it off to Anthony Barnaba to discuss some of the features that I may have, may have missed or that may need uh, the architectural enhancement and also uh, show some of the sample uh, layouts of the apartments that we're planning on installing in the building should we be awarded the contract. Why not this over again? Is this okay here or? We'll find out in a second. We're all new to this, so. Can you, uh, you use a microphone. And you guys, can you see it? We can see it, but I also want people on camera positive right. to see it if it's possible. It's, this is Chris, it's difficult to see on, on camera. You might have to bring it even closer right up to you, Steve, maybe. Here, let's <clears throat> Be fine there. Once he starts talking, the camera will go to it. So, what you do it there? You, you can get started. The get camera. started, and we'll do our best with this. We'll be able to see it, and hopefully, they. So, for the record, I'm Anthony Barnaba, project architect for uh, the Time School Development. The the drawing that's in front of you, you're seeing multiple views of. Uh, the, the site plan. <clears throat> so in this in this concept here, you're sort of seeing a village a village green concept. It's the layout that already exists. It consists of the Housatonic school, the Housatonic school, the gymnasium, and and the park in through here. That 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 is stating the obvious. That is the town center. And this drawing here, what we're what we're doing is we're illustrating potentially what could be events that take place in the in the village center. Um, this would be a pretty robust um, event, but nonetheless, it, it, it's sort of illustrating how one can think about things you have to do anyway, like driveways and parking and organize them in such a way that they're multifunctional space. <clears throat> so looking at a detail of the Housatonic School site itself, you can see where we put the driveway, the parking is in the back. The way this gets laid out, it's it's a gentle slope down, so it's handicap accessible, so the public could walk down, and this would accommodate the balance of the cars in through here, bringing it down. By leveling it out here, day to day, you have your parking, but it also gives you uh, a, a space in your village center that will allow for appropriate outdoor event. The overall concept. To, to give the, the building a restored look from the outside is to actually bring the, the existing grade down to the underside. Hold on one second. Eileen, are you, you going to tell us we can't? You can't see what he's talking about. Can't see anything at all. Yeah, we know that. Okay. Thank you. Everything in the package, though. They are in the package. So. 
The last one goes to the upper side of that stone belt force around the whole building. Hopefully, this kind of leads up to there. What we'd be doing is bringing, bringing that down to at least be under the that stone belt force to bring back the original architectural feature of, of the stonework. So that being the case, that sets. Yeah. I'm really sorry about this. That's okay. We're the only one who can see that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you want to plug down there? Okay. So this, 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 this here now sets the elevation around the building to be to be just under that that stone course. This slopes down the parking lot with the uh, the basement level down below. A little little plaza there. The green markings here are robust uh, rain gardens to capture as much runoff and have a lush planting here and along the side um, with trees there. So those are the basic site plan layouts. The overall restoration concept from the exterior is to uh, hold on one second. Just come oh, in here, Ben Elliott. Go ahead. Ben Elliott, did you have something you wanted to say? Okay. Not nothing on our end. No, and I, I would prefer if everyone just waits to speak till they're done. But um, you know, if you have questions, I'll open it to the public when he's done. We realize that the camera is not on it. This is all in the packet. So if you want to go online, all of these pictures are in the packet. There's we're having some technical difficulties. Go ahead. Okay. So that 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 for reference, and then it's brought down, and then the landscape helps to set to help the school building into into a natural setting to sort of frame up the the architectural um, layouts and really just bring back um, a restored landscape around around the the building. Um, the principles behind the the rain gardens are to promote uh, urban cooling by having a big robust area we can fill with with shade trees it it it, it counteracts the, the the heating you know the the, the urban heating uh, of having too much asphalt um we're also indicating uh future uh spots for a uh, gray water system to catch um uh, rainwater for for conservation uh, matter of practicality we having the the driveway curb cut here it lines up with um highland street so you have a basis of Sort of encouraging some placemaking where you could have uh, crosswalks and kind of regularize that that corner, um, and the facade could tie in nicely with a with a streetscape over here, where we have our rain garden in the corner here. We do have a fence, but we'd like to encourage maybe a nice stair or pedestrian access into the corner of the of the park this way, and again line up with the crosswalk and kind of make a little intersection out of that. Uh, there's the existing tree that's memorial there, um, and this kind of ties in with the existing grade of the park in through here. Uh, no sledders will be um, impacted in terms of slope being changed there. Um, down here, this ties in with the existing grade. We'll have a, a connection here, which would encourage a pathway to the get that gate over here. The grade down here is pretty much brought down to existing grade. So we're not really augmenting that, but tying that in through here. This edge here uh, ties in with the existing grade on the uh, gymnasium side, and then it catches it within this garden area in through here. So while you're changing slides, I'm being told that this is not in the packet, so we will get this online um, for people this, to see it. Okay, the drawing is, it's just not colored, that's yeah. all, but that drawing does exist. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about Please the grading while we're, while yes. we're on that grading? Uh, can, just going on the front side, uh, like uh, you mentioned, the sliding hill side over here. Yes, uh, the driveway, and then where it abuts the hill, and say the uh, flag post and, and the trees that are there. What, what's the elevation difference going from the driveway to the hill? Going from here to here? Yes, all the way, okay. all the way the length of that driveway. So, so basically, I, I'm trying to hit elevation 89 right here, which ties into the underside of that stone. So that's pretty much the existing grade in through here. And then I'm sloping with a less than 5% grade down from here. So from here to here, yeah. over 100 something feet, it goes down 
like four feet, okay. four or five feet. There's enough. That's not a, a big grade over the length where we can play with the with the curbs in such a way that you can make sure you blend it in and not. That's what I guess. Not all your, like your curb there would that be a stone wall when you're getting to the four foot mark or it, is it? It may be just go, it's, all, it's, it's all it's all going down at the same time. So it's, it's always going to be within one or two feet along this edge and through here. One or two feet. But if you had to get aggressive with it, like you might over here or over here, mm -hmm. you can. And you do see that even here on Main Street, where between the street and the sidewalk, you've got some fairly aggressive right. grade differences. I would see that in through here, but pretty much. Maybe here we have to get a little bit aggressive, but at the end of the day, you would tie into the existing slope. The flagpole is on the school side of side of things. That that would go away yeah. unless you want it. We'll give you the no, flag. No, no, no. Just curious <laughs> about the grade and what kind of hill I'm gonna have to bomb down when I'm sliding. Um, I would encourage to beef up the slope. I think the slope's a little too gentle for robust sledding, but we're not changing the slope to the detriment. Okay. But we're doing it through there. Um, do you have a question? I do. You said the um, yellow area is also handicapped. Uh, oh, so in the event slope that's sloping down, I just wanted to know what how So in the event of a public event, let's say there, there, or even just the idea of parking in the street and wanting to use the commercial space, the slope of the driveway is less than a five percent slope, which is um, um, <clears throat> a gentle enough slope where you don't need a handrail. So it's considered handicap accessible. That was my question. I wasn't quite sure um, if you're going to have a rollaway wheelchair or something. That's no, no, no. It's, it's like it's, it's like a, a, a gentle sidewalk where it doesn't need doesn't need any rail or anything like that. That meets the requirements of handicap accessibility. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, in general, for the apartment layouts. So these are the existing conditions drawings through there. The, 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 the second and third floor, or the first and second floor in terms of where the apartments are, the, the lion's share of all the construction happens within the dimension of that huge corridor. So basically, it, it's, it's and essentially the, the, the interior dimension of the corridor on the first and second floor that get the heavy renovation, which leaves the classrooms very much recognizable and intact for the different lab apartment layouts. But the key with working with an old building is to find this existing layout or, or architectural patterns and try and work within that as best you can. So the building really lends itself to doing that. And the, 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 the basis of the design will be to sort of bring in all the construction within that, within that corridor. It's not as developed and we really have to develop more of our mechanical systems for the building and stuff like that. For the, but for the basement, in general terms, the driver would be down here. The back parking lot would be here. There'd be room here for a cooking station if we wanted to do um, an outdoor um, cooking event. This would be a little um, terrace. And then this would be a commercial uh, mixed use entry where here I would go into the apartments or here I go into this commercial space over here. Um, we're showing a little stair in this in this part of the corner here to revive that window, it really the reason of having this here is more to give the residents their own private entry and exit, so they don't have to cross paths there if they don't want to. Um, I guess there's really um, a lot to say. I don't know how much we want to go over in terms of that. Um, the overall idea, as a team putting the idea together for the events, was that. Basically, hospitality is the key to economic development. So if the purpose of uh, a project is to encourage um, economic development, uh, building out the prerequisite parts, um, so they also allow for uh, public events, I think is sort of the, the, the fundamental idea in terms of, in terms of placemaking and how to encourage um, further economic development. The, the three pieces to make that happen are a development team that can bring the bring the private investment and the skill set to make it happen. Uh, authorities having jurisdiction to have the basic parameters of the of the of what's expected, the zoning bylaws in place, and also having a community entity that does in fact want to help develop the ideas of what those events will be. And I think all those ingredients are there. So you have the architectural concepts. The layouts, the development concepts. I also think there's got to be a, a, a 
an aspect where you can clean this up again. So we're getting the history right. We're understanding what kind of events people may want to add, and we can coordinate that and go from there. So that concludes my presentation. Jeff, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, um, in, going along with uh, with everything Anthony was just saying. Thank you, Anthony. By the way, um, uh, going along with that, um, you know, we have a growing list of of, of concepts for the use of um, this area, this outdoor area, and you know, with partially with with with, I'd say my, but really mine and Elliot's backgrounds. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about things like a, like a like a film festival. Um, you know, outdoor film festival, music festival, um, and also, you know, everyone's favorite, a food festival. Um, so um, these are the things that, you know, the types of opportunities, obviously, you know, you, you, we could, we could set the moon um, in terms of, um, in terms of, uh, you know, potential, you know, the myriad possible, possible uses. But once we get a little bit further along and into it, um, we're going to, you know, nail those ideas down, um, you know, and build build on real foundational uh, you know events, and see if we can you know grow that out as and as as the uh, months and years go by. So that's the goal. Okay. So I I, th I think at that point um, we're done with our our presentation. I know the board had asked some other questions, financial questions, lending questions. We provided information in the packet to respond to that, but. It's not as exciting to talk about in our presentation area. So if we want to um, maybe leave that for questions and answers, um, but there is information that should respond to all the questions that the board asked us to present in there. So I will open it up with questions now from the board and then the public. Lee, go ahead. Thank you very much for that. Um, I guess I'm a bit gun shy in that having the commercial aspects not nailed down. Um, it, my question is, right now it's substantial cost to, to excavate the, the basement and it's, it's aspirational. So uh, right now you have a, a use of a commercial aspect um, in the basement. What happens if you um, realize that you can't get the commercial tenants or it's too expensive? Have you thought about that change of use? Um, we have a um, an instance going on um, that something has changed, which can't go from a commercial aspect to a um, And I'm just wondering that nailed down this year commercial tenants, being the cost that would um, entail to create that commercial aspect. What's what's your plan B? And can we feel um, confident that you're going to be committed to this commercial aspect? Um, I'll I'll um, send this over to Jeff in one second. At this stage, when you um, submit a proposal and you don't even have full access of of surveys and all the extreme technical items to have full build out plans, and we don't have control of the um, of the product yet and the timelines, it's really hard to come in with a black and white. Um, tenant in place because when you're negotiating terms or negotiating space, you need to know that they really want to know the exact um, terms, including when the space is going to be ready. And at that, that's you know obviously very difficult from where we're standing now. But regarding if things change and what Plan B would, would be, I'll throw that over to to Jeff to respond to. So first of all, thank you, Lee, for your question. Um, second, uh, so to, to answer you, one of the things we wanted to make sure we were doing um, to deal with this was to make sure that the price that we were anticipating on the rent for that space is not too high. And now that may sound like it's not addressing what you're saying, but it, it's actually directly correlated. That space can be filled and that space can be filled with a good tenant. It's just a question of whether or not they can afford it. Right, because in a, in a situation like this, where you know you have a limited a limited number of a limited menu, let's say, of potential suitors um, for that space, um, the the one that will come forward are the ones that are, are ultimately you don't want to price it at a point where whoever takes it is going to sink because of it because it's too expensive. So we could sit there and pencil in you know twelve dollars a foot, thirteen dollars a foot, whatever. But at the end of the day, somebody coming up with five. And a half, six thousand, seven thousand dollars a month just isn't likely. 
So the way by which we priced it um, for the long term, which is which ties into how we're financing this deal and how and the project and how we're trying to make sure that the numbers don't get overextended and how we don't have we have enough debt service coverage ratio to carry the debt that we're going to take on the project is to price it at the appropriate appropriate level. So given the price point that we've put it at, we're confident. And again, we have not, you know, had open discussions with potential tenants. We have not had, um, you know, we have not had any kind of letters of interest or anything like that. Obviously it's very early days, but given the price point we're putting it at, we are confident that we will find um, a commercial or uh, not-for-profit based tenant who can make use of the space, who can integrate in the way we want them to integrate, you know, effectively the right use and that can afford it and won't go, you know, uh, under because of because of the cost of the rent. I also like to pass it off to Elliot as well because I know he has some thoughts on this on this map. Right, Elliot. Hi, Lee, and thank you for the question as well. Um, <clears throat> I think that the way from the onset, and actually, interestingly enough, one of our primary interests in this project really was because we see the ability over here to create a real synergy by bringing the park and the building kind of into one. And to us, the ideal use for the space is one where there's a green outdoor space and then there's the defined usage of the interior space. It could be for something like the you know, BIC where there could be you know, um, people who are planning things and designing things inside, and then they go out for a walk to brainstorm again. And there could be festivals where there's use of outdoor space and interior space. Kind of like um, we would love to model this as a mini um, transformation that happened in Bryan Park um, in New York City, where essentially there was a park that um, was well located, but was not programmed right. And with the right programming, we really would love to see this become a nucleus that can roll over and flow over to other um, impacts in the broader neighborhood. And you know, you are 100% correct that today we could not, and we wouldn't want to have a the defined tenant because to us that's something that the town should very much be giving us the insight and working hand in hand with the town. Um, to select that tenant. But in terms of the finances, we are very much not looking for a um, outlandish or high rent for the space, which should make it be feasible, if not for tenant A, then for tenant B. And as for, as for, to go back to what you were asking, um, Lee, uh, plan B, which is a, a perfectly reasonable question. Um, it, I, 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 I would, I, the, the, the general premise would be that if we can't find the ideal tenant, then we'll keep working until we find somebody who's good um, and good for the space. Um, as far as like flipping gears and going back to make that whole floor something else, like make that also residential units. I mean, that would it would just be if if we got to that point, then we would then it would have to be a much much bigger conversation or issue. But that's not something we foresee. That's not the way we plan on going. Um, the, the vision for the property is the vision that we have. And, and one more thing is, is just that I do know that um, Suzanne and Claire did already work up a short list of um, ideal tenants. So it's not something we have not given thought to. We actually do have a decent list of people who we would like to reach out to, but we did not want to go ahead and make those motions up until we had feedback from the town. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, obviously um, we've seen various proposals come through uh, the town for the Houston High School, and um, in some cases, it was aspirational, and there was talk of having nonprofits there and commercial tenants. And um, what we realized was that there was nothing secure. And uh, so I, I'm myself a bit gun shy, and I do realize the um, the cost that will in, be involved uh, to to make that a commercial um, space. So I'll leave it to someone else. I do have any other questions for the board? Uh, yeah, yeah so. um, I find by the financing fascinating. <laughs> um, and I just lost the, that page where you list where the money's coming from. There it is. So, can I just go through and ask a couple of questions starting from the bottom up? Of course. Um, the affordable housing contribution 
Is that our money for life and trust? It, it was in, in early discussions with uh, with the town. Um, there was a mention of potential additional pockets of subsidy for affordable housing, depending on a certain percentage of affordable units. So we originally came in with a, a percentage of, of, I think below of around 20. And here we have four of 14, uh, which uh, uh, to my math is, is close to about 40% or, or sorry, no, a little bit less, about 30%. Um, and we're trying to hit that target. Um, and we were and we were we were asking for a contribution of six hundred thousand in regards to that. I will also reiterate something that that we, we exchanged over email with um, with Mark and Chris, which was simply that um, ultimately the, the the funds that are that are that are subsidized by the town could go into this pocket or this tranche or this tranche or that or however it, it could be broken down is is really in your your hands more than ours. Um, we have put it to a place trying to balance all the levers and all the, all the numbers, including our conversations with, with lenders, local lenders, <coughs> and the debt service coverage ratio and the rents, it's a, how everything fits together, um, such that this is, the, this is the number that we feel we'll be able to launch the project with and have it make reasonable financial sense. That was the hurdle, was that- Is that, that that's, that's my question, is the, the number you have for your for capitalization, um, financing, I assume, is not the town. Town contribution, I assume, is, and affordable housing is. Um, environmental contribution? Town. Well, yeah. Okay. Don't no, forget, there is money that we have for a big. Right. Yeah. Okay. But no, if I just want, so those three numbers are what you're looking for from the town. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, t it's a grand total of 2.7 million. Yeah. Anything else, sir? No. Eric or Garfield? Yeah, no, the, the finances, uh, that's what I was questioning also that Ed uh, hit on. Um, and then at, when we were first in discussion about it, um, your, the drinking water uh, filtration system that was being promoted uh, the first time around, mm -hmm. um, is that, is that, a, I, I see it's, Budget permitting. I just, I guess, I wanted to know your thoughts on that and, and how that would be incorporated. This was a dis this was a discussion that was was carried out between Anthony and ourselves, um, and we have not uh, again at this stage of the game. Uh, we without any bid drawings, we aren't able to price that out specifically. Um, we are fully intending on putting that into the budget. It's a it's a major priority, but because of uh, that's a very case specific. Um, niche product that uh, you know have has not been in previous developments for us. So we want to make we we just wanted to ask or accept that it's a per, that's a you know that could be something that would look at later, uh, depending you know what the costs are. But it's by no means a a a that's no means a a, a plan a built in excuse. Uh, we're intending on putting that forth. We just don't know enough about it yet. Um, Anthony has more experience with it than we do. Um, we, we don't know if about that yet to, 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 to stand solidly on it, but it's, it's, it's full intended to be, to be going into the building. And then with, with the 2.7 being asked, uh, from the town, uh, does that mean you have, uh, no intention of asking for a tax agreement or. No, nope, the tax like agreement is also being requested. So being requested. Yeah. The tax agreement is also being requested. And again, that also fits into the category of trying to make the numbers work. Eric, do you have anyone? Um, that's it for right now. Go 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 ahead. Okay. I'm not gonna lie, you're not a numbers guy, but I'd like to um, understand the six hundred thousand dollars you're asking from the affordable housing committee. That was I'm understanding, and that's for the possible for apartments that might be affordable housing. Yes. So again, from the um, from the earlier conversations we had with the town um, uh, before we entered into you know more serious conversations and then the proposal construction, it was floated uh, to us in some conversation. I can't remember when that there would potentially be uh, an additional contribution possible from the town 
towards a an affordable housing component. So we, in this current plan, have four of the 14 units sitting as uh, listed as affordable, which means they would be deemed affordable, which means they would be held to the maximum rents that met that categorization uh, with the, the affordable, uh, affordable Housing Act and board and all those and all those other criteria. They would always be rented out that way for, I believe, I believe there's, a, I could be wrong, Ali, you might have this legislature on, at the tip of your fingers better than myself, but I believe it's 20 years. Um, and so for that, um, for that designation of taking those four units and taking the, the rents down and making sure they meet affordable housing criteria and that the tenants who are acquire those units as, as tenants um, are categorized as, as qualifying for affordable housing rates. Um, once that's, once the, so, so in, in, in lieu of that, we were asking for a $600,000 um, uh, co contribution. And this may be something that you can answer with the board, can you answer with someone else? Um, what if that $600,000 you don't get if you were from, from the affordable housing? Is, <clears throat> I'm on that board. Every it's not necessarily from the affordable housing trust, it's from okay. everywhere that the town wants to provide it. Okay. We can't speak for them. You can't speak for whom? The affordable housing trust. Right, that's why I'm yeah. asking. No, it, it, it's from anywhere that that money would be available. Anything else, Trevor? No, I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. Yeah, but you're they're, they're, in all due respect, they don't care where the money comes from as long as the money is provided. So it doesn't necessarily have to come from the affordable okay, housing trust. We're, we're, we're out trying to do our thing as well, and we would probably run over to something else. Uh, I don't That's my opinion. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, so the budget is $5.8 million, and you're looking um, from the town $2.7 million, actually. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Is that the. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that seems uh, quite a lot. Um, we're not getting our opinion tonight. We're only asking questions. Oh, okay. My question then um, is. Historic preservation of exterior. Are you going to be seeking historic tax credits? So the answer is likely no. And I know that I'm saying likely no, um, but um, I uh, will just be a little more a little more specific about that. Generally speaking, for developers to cross the the hurdle uh, of, of 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 dealing with the pains of trying to acquire a historical tax credit, there's sort of like a minimum threshold or a critical mass. That you have to clear a bar that you have to go before it becomes, for lack of better words, worth it, um, because you need to hire for, for all the what's called the uh, the the qualified re restore re re the qualified restorative restorative costs QRCs. Um, you need to bring in a consultant. You need to bring in reports. You need to bring in like it's it's a whole list of stuff, and those have get out of bed fees, if you will. Like they're just not going to be any less than a certain minimum cost. Um, so in a case like this, generally speaking, I think you would you would we would probably qualify for about um, and ba this is based on my research and based on Elliot's experience about between twelve and fifteen percent of the cost of the project, but then that would get chewed up in a lot of fees and a lot of time and cost. So it would kind of at the end of the day be a wash. There might be a bit of a benefit there, but it would also slow up the project by a significant margin because at certain milestones. These your, the project is held up until the report is done, until the investigation is done, until it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So ultimately, our it is our uh, uh, take as developers that it is not worth it to do it on this project. That it would that it would be a a, a a bear to the project, if you will, and that ultimately. But on that note, I want to be very clear: this on the note of historical and the heritage and the and the and the and the, <clears throat> the beauty of the building. We're drawn to the building because of the beauty of the building. So there has to be a certain. Uh, I want to. I want to. I want to emphasize our intent to beautify the structure and to bring it up and highlight that historical quality to it. So the two things are not, you know, uh, mutually inclusive, it, they're, 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 nor mutually exclusive. The the although we're not filing for historical tax credit, we have no intention of slapping up a coat of paint on brick and you know and, and calling it macaroni. So. Um, I hope that answers your question. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, just uh, switching gears a little bit. I want to go to the <clears throat> the, the pop up tents and um, 
the location. This is, um, I assume, like a seasonal setup. Um, I guess I know it's just an idea, but uh, just curious if, if these tents go up, that they're obviously going to take up a majority of the parking in that zone. But um, are these? I guess I just want to get the idea of what 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 their their use is and and how long they would be up. Um, Oh, they, the, the tent would only go up for an event specific, uh, the actual period of time of the event, and then it would be folded up and put away. Um, and that, also, that pardon me? It's, it would be that easy, that quick, I guess. I just sometimes you see the tents. Uh, I've, I've been to outdoor festivals and, and items like you were discussing, and sometimes they're pretty elaborate and almost like uh, people are using for outdoor eating at this point, it's basically a structure outside and they still call it outdoors, you know? So it's, uh, right. I was just wondering to the extent of about of, yeah, the, of yeah. the structure that we're calling the tent. I think we're looking, and again, Anthony, you might want to comment on this as well, and I'll pass it over to you after this, but we're looking for a quick and, and uh, malleable solution. It's not something that's, that's, that's cheap and it's going to break apart, but something that can be, Unloaded out of a compartment on in, in the in the in the uh, storage area of the ground floor, set up very quickly. There'll be a regular routine. You know, there'll be there'll be a of usual suspects that are involved in these things. A usual, a usual suspects, you know, caterer or somebody who's going to man the grill. You know, a usual suspects, you know, wait staff or team that we that we bring in. It anybody that wants to do these events that we have, you know, a, just a, everything sort of ready to go. Like here's 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 the you know. We want to do it differently okay but this is this is the way we we do it um and then have that be a process that can be repeated over and over again depending on what the event is um and again that's why earlier i said we don't want to bite off more than we can chew we want to make this a possibility we want to design it correctly we want to think through you know kind of like an event management um think through what's the simplest uh you know direct distance between two points to get from here to here. And then whenever those events are in are, are, are greenlit, you know, we clear the parking for that period of time. Everyone is aware who parks there is aware that when there's an event, they have to move. Um, it's limited to a certain amount of inconveniences a year and we have the event and then we pack it up and we put it away. So that, that, that's what we're going to. Anthony, do you want to, do you want to comment on that? The town won't, the village won't be overrun with events. I mean, the, the cadence and the amount of the size is going to have to strike a balance between what are people, what are the events that people want to see. There's going to have to be some exchange. So, generically speaking, when when you're in a in a town setting or an urban setting or a village setting, the thinking now is when you do lay out your parking, when you think, do lay out your driveways and your sidewalks, lay them out in such a way that it's not just for a car, but that it's it's now a potentially public space you can program. It. Think of it uh, like um, Iredale's parking lots. It, day to day, it's a parking lot, but every every weekend in the summer, it's a farmer's market. You have that kind of flexibility with your with your village spaces. And the, the, the village center right now kind of all goes like that. So by, by sort of paving it and grading it in such a way, you've got different scale, basically public spaces, you kind of imbue the program for some civic activity. Then just one one other question with with the rain gardens, which it sounds like a uh, great idea. Just just curious. Um, I didn't see a good view of that drawing, but there there still be access to the back of the community center, that one driveway there. One of the drawings I thought it looked like the rain gardens almost uh, went up to the directly to the back of the community center, but wrapped around it. Uh, maybe we just the oh maybe we just the curb cut. Okay. Yeah. So this this right here would still be this is the property line. Yeah. That's all. All yes. I'll tell you my I can get, get more parking and just lay it over here, but that's not my job right now. Yeah. I can yeah. get more parking here, and then when this interface, you may want to like a gravel trench or something, but that would potentially bring some water in here, and that could set. Off from there, you know, a lot of roof, a lot of paving, not necessarily, um, you know, you don't want a lot better up close. Okay, um, looking back on the financing, so I'm curious about um, the money that's being sought from the town versus leveraging state funding and uh, federal funding. So, 
um, you stated that you won't be seeking historic tax credits. Will you be seeking uh, low income housing tax credits? And how will the affordable housing piece work to ensure that the tenants are between 60 and 80 percent AMR? Jeff? Uh, Elliot? Um, so I just want to be you know, abundantly clear from the onset. If it is the desire of the town to slow down the process and start seeking state or federal funding, we're not opposed to doing that. Our understanding was that this is a particular building in the center of town that's been sitting for a rather long period of time. And the sooner we can um, you know, put the electrodes on it and bring energy, life, and vitality to this area, the better it would be for the municipality and for the area. But if it's the intent that we should try to go ahead and see which other grants, funding, et cetera, is available, we're not opposed to doing that. That being said, um, our initial process was to see what can we go ahead to get immediate funds in place to get started. Um, in terms of the oversight on those tenants, um, currently it's not scheduled to be done through any um, particular organization, but rather to use the state and federal guidelines for that. Um, it'll be an open book. We're very happy for anybody at any point in time to uh, <laughs> to have full transparency on everything that's going on. Um, and again, the intent is really for the public good rather than you know something that should be shrouded in secrecy. So we have no problem to have anything be open you know, to ensure both from the town as well as from any other um, places that, that would be deemed necessary to have any type of insight and oversight as needed. Um, following up on that, so I guess I'm con cognizant that one of the um, positive aspects about your proposal is that it ensures that uh, people of low income can um, potentially uh, have up to four units in Lusitonic. So um, seeing that there won't be anyone managing that income qualification, I, I guess that is one of my concerns or questions really that um, how do we feel, and it's it's more of an open question, how would we feel um, confident that the tenants that um, have incomes between 60 and 80% AMI would actually uh, have a chance to um, be tenants in this building, so. Oh, well, uh, I, I mean, the, the way that, it's, that we have this elsewhere is um, they need to provide the proof of income and the management company that's going to ultimately be dealing with the leases and everything else would be responsible to verify that, um, and that would be open to an audit. Are, are you on? The, are you asking something different? Because if you are, I don't think uh, I'm understanding the question. That's that's fine. Yeah. So it's the management company that would be handling it. Absolutely. And, and again, we are very comfortable to have everything. If the town would like to put in a overriding requirement that we register either quarterly, annually, biannually, whatever it is, um, to, to show that proof as far as we're concerned, we have no problem with this because this whole project to us genuinely is about injecting vitality into this area in the way that's best for the town. Thank you. Okay, we'll take public questions now of the applicant, James. Go ahead and ask your question. I apologize, my hand was raised in error. Okay. Donna Jacobs, just state your name and address. Hi, I'm Donna Jacobs. I'm at, two, I'm at 260 Park Street in Housatonic. Uh, it's also known as Route 183 half a mile north of Division Street and probably a mile or so from the location that you're talking about developing. You know, it's it's mind boggling to think about the demands being placed on our select board to make decisions that are going to be affecting the uh, development of our municipality and our economic viability going forward. It's huge. And so when you present something like a project like this to the select board, I don't know how we make this decision. It seems to me that a decision like your project needs to be integrated with other elements of going forward, like what are we doing about the water, which I am suffering. I don't want to so, talk so about it. Now's the time for questions. Okay, yeah. so I guess the question 
and maybe our, our presenters cannot answer this, but the question would be, how do you see your project being integral to the development of the area, preserving the historic charm that draws people to the area? I hear the infusion of vitality, but I'm also feeling a pressure or a demand to make a quick decision. And I don't know if it's fair to the town or the select board to have to respond and make a decision so quickly. Um, it, and it, I'm, it, I'm, I'm, yes. Uh, their decision of quickly move, it's our decision. And we've set this timeline. You know what? You broke up. I didn't hear you. We're the ones setting the timeline as a town. The developers are not setting the timeline. We've set the timeline. And many people will say we've dragged our feet way too long already. So uh, I'd be glad to ask the first part of the question then, but as far as the timeline, that's unfair because it isn't their timeline, it's ours. Um, and before I um, send this over to, to Jeff, I just, the, to follow up on the timeline, I think when we speak about timeline, it's getting the project started, getting it finished and getting it living in the community, not delay, delay, financing delay, um, permitting delay, grant delay. So um, again, as I think you heard the partners talk about, we would be open to seeking some other finances, but then that takes away our commitment to getting this done and up and running and um, the timeline that we've presented to you in this packet. So Jeff. Yeah, if I may, I'd love to respond to the question, the part of the question that had to deal with um, not the, so much the timeline and the pressure to resolve, but more the the, the integration of the, this project into the rest of the town. On an infrastructure level, I have, it's, it's, that's, that's above my, uh, my pay grade, um, uh, as it were. Um, but but as, far as, as far as what we see the building as doing, I think the question ultimately breaks down to what do we see this building as really doing? By the way, I apologize profusely for that car alarm that's going off right there. I really hope it's not mine. I, 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 I'll, I'll, we'll just roll with it until somebody finally finds a remote and fix it off. Anyway, um, on, 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 all sincerity um, on, on on the issue regarding um, regarding integration. You know, both Elliot and I are, are are huge, passionate fans of great architecture. You know, when when the um, Highline was being developed in, in New York City, and I understand this is not New York City, but when the Highline was being developed in New York City, um, you know, nobody, no bank could really get their heads around it. They're like, so is it a commercial thing? Is it a, is, is it, is it a residential? Like you're, you're building a walkway, like what, you know, it was very confusing. And ultimately the use case of it is crazy. It's packed all the time. It creates a life. It lends itself to the generation of economic activity, of, of community activity, of integration, of, of, of communication. So great architecture does this. Um, and so the reason why myself, Elliot, Anthony Barnaba, Kathleen, uh, Claire, and, and Suzanne are all very passionate about this because we see the potential for a really cool space that's going to have that flow and that, and that mixed use, literally mixed use where people are coming and going um, without you know, stepping on each other's toes. And, 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 and having this kind of like vita this, this life to it, vitality, as Elliot said. So I, I, I'm try I hope this answers your question, uh, Donna, um, uh, because it, we, we want the, the, this high point in the center of town to, to carry a certain life to it that will sort of you know, lead the way or point the way for, for other development in the area. You know. Thank you very much. Um, ben Elliot. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, ben Elliott, 207 Pleasant Street, uh, Hussitani. Um, I apologize if these are kind of repetitive. I had couldn't see the drawings, so I... No, I, we, we understand. Okay. Um, but um, I guess I had some trouble following the, the discussion of the grade of the parking lot. Will there be a retaining wall? Will the actual parking lot be lower than the grade of the hill? The, the back parking lot gets lowered. But it gets lowered so that the, 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 the back corner actually meets the existing grade. And then it, 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 it elevation 85 from the, from the drawing. So that brings it down to four feet. But then that, that line of the parking lot that's closest to the abutter, the residential unit on the back, that's the existing grade. And then that slopes back down to a cash basin. So okay. by the time, so by the time any development 
gets to the property line, it's blended into the existing grade. And for that part of the parking lot, would you be you'd be cutting into the trees that kind of abut that property on the back of the school? Yeah, so that 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 would cut into the trees that are on the, the school property, but at the end of the day, there would still be enough buffer which could be heavily treed and and it probably put back. Yes, it could be relandscaped. Um, thank you. My other question um, just concerns parking. Um, you currently, if I was reading the sketches in the packet correctly, do you have 15 spaces? Yes. And so that's 15 spaces for 14 residential units and a commercial business? One, one handicap so that the commercial space can, can meet the handicap requirements. Uh, okay. the, the, the street would be close enough in less than 300 feet, but I, I just thought it would be best to allocate one, one handicap space in the, in the back and then one parking space per unit, which is 14 plus the one is 15. And I presume uh, with a coordination, there would still be some parking in the street. But uh, for mixed use, you generally want to give at least one spot per unit. Then you hope the, the rotation of people's schedule allows them to sort of share the parking. Sure. I, I think my concern is that you'll be relying on the street parking and increasing the amount of traffic, especially at um, a high pedestrian crossing into the park. Um, in the sketch, I noticed that you had two crosswalks on both sides of Highland Street crossing Pleasant Street, though those don't actually currently exist. Um, so maybe this is more of a question for the town, but will there be pedestrian safety measures put in place with this development? Um, you know, that access right now, what will be the active driveway for this project is a pretty heavily trafficked entrance to the park for children and families going to the park. So what safety measures are going to be in place to make you know the traffic for this development and pedestrian traffic coexist? The best answer I can give you is it's too it's premature, but we'll we'll do what we have to do. Yes, there definitely will be safety measures. Thank you. Donna, go ahead. Donna, your hand was up. Just unmute yourself and. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I want to just follow up on the question about the parking and the safety of pedestrian traffic. You know, it isn't New York City. I moved here from New York City 10 years ago, and you really moved here for quiet, not for Bryant Park kinds of experiences. But I do want to say that people up here do not take public transportation as they do in New York City. And um, most people have two cars at least and a truck. So when you come up here and you're developing housing or uh, amenities for local people and, and people who are moving into the area, we have to take into consideration that people travel here by car and, and most residences have more than one car. And if you drive by and you look at the driveways, you're going to see two, maybe three cars in a driveway. So that's just a bit of information. It's not really a question, but just to follow up on the point made to the previous questions about parking. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. And you're, you're zooming in, and it was very enlightening. So we really appreciate it. Right, it's beyond enlightening. It's exciting that there's interest in this building. Yeah, we thank you guys for your time and for asking all the great questions. And we're excited to keep going with the process until we all get it right. Yes. So really, thank you for your time. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Regardless of whatever way it goes, whatever decision, we realize that the town has a very tough decision to make ahead of it. But regardless of that, it's been it's been a pleasure, and we really thank you for your time and your and your and your uh, allowances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Well, thank I remember you. that right now we have eight panelists, and we had eighteen attendees. Next on the agenda is the capital purchases maximum useful life determination. Next case. Uh, no, I don't take this one. Actually. Actually. So uh, in your packet for tonight, unfortunately it was a blank sheet, um, but staff is recommending, well, so we're moving forward uh, with a borrowing for uh, items that were approved at the last town meeting. And we're recommending that you approve the following. Uh, six years for the highway truck, nine years for the sewer cleaner, five years for the clarifier, and eight years for the mower. Okay. 
Hopefully I've written yeah. down, so I'll give you <laughs> there. I do make fun of people who use paper, but occasionally it is, uh, it works. Okay, so I read this first? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm glad I brought my glasses. I, the clerk of the select board of the town of Great Barrington, Massachusetts, certify that at a meeting of the board held on October 24th, October 24th, 2022, of which all members of the board were duly notified at which a quorum was present, the following vote was unanimously passed, all of which appears upon the official record of the board and in my custody. Voted that the maximum useful life of the departmental equipment listed below to be financed with the proceeds of the borrowing authorized by votes of the town passed June 6, 2022, Articles 5 and 8, is hereby determined pursuant to GL Chapter 44, Section 71, to be as follows. Purpose, Public Works Highway Truck. Borrowing amount, 170,900. Maximum useful life, six years. Sewer cleaner equipment. Borrowing amount, $137,000. Maximum useful life, nine years. Wastewater clarifier equipment. Borrowing amount, 103700 Maximum useful life, four, five years. Public works roadside mower. Borrowing amount, 51128 Maximum useful life, eight years. I further, I further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public, that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting which agenda included the adoption of the above votes, was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in a matter conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that the office of the town clerk is located or, or if applicable in accordance with an alternative method of notice prescribed or approved by the attorney general as set forth in 940 CMR 29.032B, at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, prior to the time of the meeting, and remain so posted at the time of the meeting, that no deliberations or decision in connection with the subject matter of this vote were taken in executive session, all in accordance with GL Chapter 30A, Sections 18 through 25, as amended. Second. Any discussion? I got just just out of curiosity, the maximum useful life is that just from past experience? Is that like a set time that uh, the state or municipalities have to choose, or is that we have a range between five and twenty years yeah. that we can choose? This was the maximum useful life recommended by the department heads that use this equipment. Oh. Anyone else? Roll call vote. Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Ed, annual update from the Cultural District. Yeah, I'll do this somewhat quickly and I'll be reading the notes. Um, the downtown, downtown Great Barrington Cultural District held its annual meeting on October 6th, uh, several weeks ago. Um, yeah, part of the responsibility of that. District are to report to the select board annually, so this is that report. Uh, cultural districts in the Commonwealth are designated and largely funded by the Massachusetts Cultural Council in order to foster local cultural business and job development and attract artists and cultural enterprises to a defined walkable area for the concentration of cultural events. Uh, the downtown Quebec Cultural District is more or less from St. James Place right next door to the library and a few blocks on either side of Main Street. Um, on the, the Cultural District's website, there's an actual map. The district is run by a volunteer steering committee of representatives of cultural institutions and businesses in and near the district. The district is staffed by our own Chris Rembo and by Virtual Regional Planning Commission staff members. Uh, the staff does the bulk of the work. Uh, I represent the town, which is a member, and I've co chaired the steering committee for the past two years. In that capacity, I'm offering this report of the accomplishments of the past year and goals for the next year. So, real quickly, the accomplishments 
we supported individual artists through our sponsorship of Berkshire Bus Festival. Our financial support increased over previous year and specifically was used to help pay performance performer stipends. We also supported individual artists through our collaboration with other Berkshire Cultural Council dis districts, I'm uh, sorry, Berkshire County Cultural Districts to present Art Week Berkshires, which was a 10 day festival with over 120 events spread throughout 15 communities. The five uh, Berkshire County districts and our media partners helped increase awareness of artists locally and around the region. And the artwork landing page on berkshires.org had over 5,600 unique page views and social media posts generated more than 140,000 impressions. We increased our following on social media. The main purpose of our social media accounts is to share news from cultural, ent cultural entities and artists in and around the district. Our total audience grew by 38% this year with 3,000 followers across platforms. But going forward, we'll be invest investing more heavily. We increased awareness of the district this past summer through Berkshire Beckons, a collaborative project funded entirely by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. It was a three-month project that included cultural districts, chambers of commerce, outdoor recreation venues throughout the Berkshires. It included digital retargeting and social media promotion. They delivered 39 million impressions on Google Ads Network, 7 million impressions through Facebook and Instagram this past summer. And each partner received a list of over 3,100 e email addresses we can now use to connect directly uh, with people who might be interested in visiting here. We worked with Silo Media, which is a local uh, marketing group, to help make our website more user-friendly. And we added a section featuring all the artists who contributed to our banner project. Our banner project. Uh, you may have seen the banners up on Lamppost last year. We recruited local artists to help us develop banners honoring the many facets of arts and culture and many of the specific cultural attractions in and around downtown Great Barrington. Banners on from the streetlights, streetlight posts last year, and this year they've been arranged all 26 banners in a mural format on the car hardware wall. Um, that where car hardware has given us permission to leave them up indefinitely. Goals for the coming year, our fifth year, is to improve the visitor experience by supporting improvements to the downtown historic walking tour app and improve wayfinding signage. We want to attract more of the public to the downtown by increasing our sponsorship of the Berkshire bus and also exploring other partnerships focused on visual art installations. We'll invest in paid assistance for a social media expert to ensure our work is more widely seen and we'll keep working with fellow cultural districts around the Berkshires to collaborate on other collaborations like Art Week. Finally, I served as the co-chair for the last few years, sharing the job this past year with Seth Keys, who's the artistic director of St. James, uh, Chris Cancer, Chris Cantor, who runs the Berkshire Arts Market, the Farmers Market, uh, will be um, co-chairing with Seth during the coming year. Uh, anybody have any questions? If anybody wants uh, those notes, I can fix the typos and send them out on request. Thank you. Any no questions? Moving ahead to the right of first refusal, select court to vote to waive or exercise the town chapter 61 right of first refusal, 79 acres located on 200 North Plain Road, parcel 40 of assessor's map 28. Hi, Kate McCormick. I'm here on behalf of Catherine A. Ruger, trustee of the Dennis Robert O'Connor Sr. 2017 Irrevocable Trust. Um, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, my client is under contract to sell the property. Um, it's currently um, subject to an agricultural lien, a Chapter 61 lien. The purchaser is going to continue using it as um, an agricultural property. She's not trying to remove it out of 61A. Um, but we are asking for the town to waive its option to purchase under Mass General Laws. Um, we were in front of the planning board. Um, I believe they sent a positive um, recommendation um, recommending waiver. And then this, um, a few hours ago, the Conservation Commission met. I don't know if you've received their, their letter yet, but they held a special meeting, um, which I also believe they were um, recommending waiver of this option of purchase. So I'm requesting the board to do so. 
Chris, do you have anything you want to add to this? Good evening, board. Chris Rumble speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, what Kate said about the Conservation Commission vote is correct. They also voted that the select board uh, waive the, the right of first refusal, not exercise the right of first refusal. Um, just so so the board knows it's uh, the power to exercise or waive it or to transfer the transfer the right to, for example, a nonprofit partner, that power resides with you, the select board. Um, and our process is to go uh, and ask the planning board in CONCOM for their advice uh, in these matters. Um, in this particular case, you heard Kate say that the land will stay in the chapter program, and so it will stay in agricultural use. Um, that also means that a lien will stay in place so that if there is a use change or transaction in the future, we can have this conversation again. Thank you, Chris. Do I have a motion to waive the town's Chapter 61 right of first refusal? I'll name presumptive, but I think that's what we're planning to do. I move that the select board vote to waive or exercise. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, excuse me. There's too, too many millions of dollars yes. to exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, I uh, make a motion that the select board vote to waive the town's chapter 61 right of first refusal on 79 acres located at 200 North Frame Road, parcel 40 of assessor's map 28. Second. Discussion. So as, as Chris said, um, if this was to come out of 61, we would be having this conversation again, and we have a guarantee that the buyer's keeping it in that, right? So there's- That, that is correct. Great. That and you don't have a million two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> It's not a safe somewhere. <laughs> Any other discussion? Roll call vote Garfield. Aye. Eric. Aye. Ed. Aye. Lee. Aye. And uh, it's unanimous. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Um, Mark, do you, would you have that signed for pickup tomorrow? The it, yes. Over? Yes, it's in it's in there. <laughs> so we can wait so we can probably get it tonight. If you want to just well, I'll send somebody over. <laughs> okay. Uh citizen speak time. Hi, it's uh, Donna Jacobs at yeah. 260 Park Street again, and I really hope that you're all not finding me to be a real pain in the neck. Um, but because I, I, you're, I'm really awestruck by how much you all have to figure out and decide what to do. Um, and it's exciting to think about uh, developers wanting to come into the area. It's exciting that the Division Street Bridge is going to be opening. Um, but I am concerned, as an earlier speaker is concerned, about quality of life. So, for example, with the opening of the Division Street Bridge, she's concerned about traffic and speeding on her street. Well, I'm a half mile north of Division Street. And I'm in one of these old houses that was built uh, to house management and workers for uh, the Risingdale Mills. These are very special properties. And we're on route also known as 183, which is marked at 35 miles an hour and people are going at 50 and 55. <coughs> so she's worried about Division Street, I understand completely. I am taking my life every time in my hands when I go to my mailbox. And what I'm asking the select board to consider with while we're considering all the new developments and the growth of the community that we stay somewhat cognizant of the quality of life. And we try to preserve and protect what we have here so that people don't speed through our residential areas, so that our residents are safe, so that we have clean water. I'd really like to see that 2.7 million going to cleaning up the water here in Housatonic rather than a developer who wants to do something creating Bryant Park in Housatonic. Um, but that's just a bias. Uh, so I'm asking and, and just expressing my desire that um, you all and all of your considerations, not to forget the quality of life, water, safety, traffic safety, home safety. And, and those of us who've moved into the area to preserve some of these historic homes. Um, we are, some of us are a restoration. We restore these old homes. My home was built in 1890. My neighbors was built in 1700. It's on the historic registry and trucks are barreling by and breaking the plaster. So if we could put up those little 
monitors of speed that we see around town on some of our streets and get people into the habit of respectfully driving through our area and appreciating the beauty of the area and the beauty of the architecture by obeying our speed limits. That's all I'm asking. If there's anything that we can do to, to in that effect, water and traffic, I'd be very grateful. Thank you, Donna. Can I just say that the police appreciate a call if you call them and let them know where you're seeing the speeding, they will place the sign there. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, I, I did call the police. They put up one of those monitors for about three weeks. It wasn't long enough to get people into the habit of slowing down to 35 miles an hour. Thank you. Uh, and then they took it away. And that's what this was about two years ago. I requested it. Uh, ben Elliott. I can you hear me. Yes. Uh, ben Elliott, 208 Pleasant Street. I think I said 207 before, and that's the school. Uh, uh, I thought maybe you moved. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think it'd be a little chilly right now. Um, I realized, and I, I don't know if the panelists are gone, so I apologize, but I, there was just one more thing I wanted to ask about uh, the, the design. Um, they are gone, but you're, welcome, you're more than welcome to pose the question. Okay. Um, the, in the drawings, uh, I know the rain garden would be put on the west side of the building, um, and I, kind of in line with what Eric was asking about the access to the back of the community center, um, but it's kind of hard to tell from the drawings where the property line would actually kind of cut into the Hoosie Dome parking lot. So I'm just curious, with their current designs, would we be losing parking spots um, with the ring garden and the pathway over on that side? Well, the answer they said was no. No. I, the, when I saw the picture close up, the, the line runs almost uh, along the line where, say, the, the public sand location is. So the, okay. So if you're looking at it straight on, it would be the left side. And it looked like he had drawn in about six or so, six or eight spots going face in. So they would be facing the rain garden, facing the school. So I feel like an L-shaped parking, similar to what it is now, but just more condensed. So like the spots that are currently up against the side of the school would kind of be moved into the lot? Is that okay? That's, the way that, that's what the drawing shows. Okay. And would it still have the same access from that part would it would it cut off the, the, the community center it appeared that the community center access to the back door and the side door were still all intact um okay thank you and there was a walkway through the rain garden to get to the school yeah and just the the actual the entrance for cars on the school side of the parking lot that wouldn't be obstructed by anything we'd still have that kind of half circle flow through that through the parking lot the half circle for the community center yeah yeah that was on not in the drawing and i, I don't believe they would have no. anything to do with that okay thank you okay. um select boards time garfield Matt, and then eric um just just a little bit uh excited to see these proposals coming in and excited to see the next one uh coming down the line and uh, yeah, that's it. Ed? Hey, yeah, just I know the um, finance chair is still on. I wanted to thank them for the memo on OPEP. I know we talked about it a few years ago and I never did anything. So I want to thank them for bringing it up again. Look forward to discussing it at budget time. Please. Uh, just happy Halloween to everyone on Monday night. Um, trip your feet safe and have fun. Media time. Yes, go ahead. Look, he's in the room. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Sean. It's Nancy Editor of the Berkshire Edge. Uh, just two questions, so pretty quick. Um, the two proposals for who's time waterworks, are they going to be publicly available? That, that there is no proposal for the appraisal? The yeah. appraisal. We, we can share a copy. We're still waiting for two more. Yeah. Okay, so at least one more, but hopefully two more. Um, concerning the mattress moratorium. Where can residents dispose of their mattresses as this moratorium goes on? Um, the Lennox Dale? Yeah. I would say that they would probably drive it to either Lennox Dale to the Valley or Casella 
uh, transfer station, or there's two transfer stations that they can go to in New York State, one in Hillsdale and one in Kane and New York. Okay. If they reach out to the DPW staff, we probably have some information. And, and the hope is it's not long. Right? No, we do. just, we need to, we need to uh, figure out a way to store them and bag them to keep them dry and out of the weather. And we, we just don't have a plan in place quite yet. So, so you don't have an estimate how long this is going to take? No, I, we'll, we'll figure it out as quickly as we can, but um, yeah, I, I think we're going to just hit the pause button while we purchase a shed or relocate a shed or something to that effect. Okay. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else from the media? Seeing none, by unanimous consent, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.